can you explain a little bit if, 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 if you know kind of what is kind of hindering uh, the emergence of more nutrition-centered uh, goals and satisfaction uh, in the SDGs? It's the fact that there are already 169 ornaments on that Christmas tree, and there's not room for more. Um, you know, but it, it's a give and take. We want it to be as comprehensive and, and, and true to how we need to address the issues, but at, again, at what point it is, is it too much? So it's really just that give and take of the size and the feasibility. Right, or at least a recognition that nu nutrition and uh, resolving hunger and malnutrition and the nutrition and the agriculture development and the anti-hunger efforts are core to everything, a recognition that, that yeah, nutrition is an essential piece of each of, the, <laughs> each of those individual uh, ornaments and is kind of a buttressing uh, uh, thing or essential part uh, of that. Shangin, anything from your perspective on the, what's, what's lying ahead? Well, first, let me echo what Liz said about the importance of um, hunger and malnutrition in the post-2015 agenda. So how can we end extreme poverty when the people's stomach is still empty, when the people are still undernourished? So I would put much higher priority of food, nutrition security, than poverty. Mm -hmm. Poverty is also uh, defined in a, in a different way, whether it's a $1.25 or whether it's $2.00. The nutrition, hunger, we can measure them, we can track them. But a part of the challenge is the nutrition is a cross-cutting issue. Yes, we do have a separate independent indicator, but to solve malnutrition problem, we need action from this is 17 goals, right? Many different areas. So how can we really make sure that nutrition will be mainstreamed or integrated into all these different goals. That's one challenge. Another challenge is accountability or governance. If you look at a government agency, there's no single government agency that is responsible for nutrition. Ministry of Health, nutrition as a disease, Ministry of Agriculture, we just to try to argue for more food, more food, food self-sufficiency. So how can we combine all this together? to really focus on nutrition, nutrition outcome. Now, I do have a comment on this road map. I mean, this is a great, great road map. The four pillars, Rick described it very much consistent from what uh, we have learned uh, from Rick Pratt. But a road map should also have a clear time frame. Well, post-2015 agenda, normally used 2030, uh, to end extreme hunger by uh, extreme poverty by 2030. But do you have a time frame? Oh, we can always end hunger, but by when? By 2050, by 2030, 2025, mm -hmm. or even before that? Do you allow us to challenge each other? Please, yes. Well, Rick's got a mic. You, you can walk around now if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that it's a good challenge, and we in the roadmap should embrace this challenge, and, and part of what we'll do as a coalition is respond to it. I think part of the problem you've identified, and that is understanding the magnitude of the issue, especially now as we look at what's happening across the world in terms of refugee flows and displaced people. Uh, we now have in this quote, global community uh, over 50 million displaced people and refugees. We have not had this number of people uh, displaced and refugees since World War II. So as conflict and the, the concerns and the implications of climate and natural disasters increase, um, it is hard to get our arms around the number of people that need food assistance and support because of conflict and natural disaster. Um, I think that uh, we should uh, think more clearly about how we can achieve some of the other objectives. We have major gaps, though. Uh, I think the uh, one of the recommendations about building capacity in country relates to the safety net systems, and there needs to, while there's been commitments, the African <coughs> Union and others have talked about a commitment to building safety net systems, there needs to be more capacity building, technical assistance to help countries do that. I think we've made major uh, achievements in terms of understanding nutrition, but you can still go into a lot of countries and there's a lack of understanding about dietary diversity, exclusive breastfeeding, mm -hmm. importance of sanitation, and the other issues that are relevant. 
So I think it's a good challenge, and we'll embrace that challenge, and maybe it'll be part of the addendum to Roadmap 3, is trying to determine what makes sense across all of our organizations as to what would be an acceptable time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Can so I ask a question. Please, I was going to say, Shang, does that satisfy you, or does? <laughs> mm. <laughs> 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 they're, 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 they're thinking of. I yeah, we've got to well, got to work our common time. What I've agreed to do today is <laughs> represent the entire coalition. So I'm not going to always talk exactly from uh, my personal perspective, but we as an organization need to address mm. these, or as a coalition. But can I ask Liz um, about the G7 and yeah. thoughts about the U.S. government yeah. commitments at G7 around nutrition and some of the other food security issues? Sure. Well, the G7 is a, is a really great venue to push some of these global issues on hunger and nutrition. And one thing I kind of like to look at is the kind of recent history of the G8 and the G7 and how it's tracked. And you really kind of can see a story coming out of that. So if you look at the G8 in 2009 at, at L'Aquila, that's where we made, all countries made major public commitments to um, invest in food security and nutrition. Nutrition. And then you see at the Camp David Summit in 2012, where we, I think there was a recognition that yes, we have to have these public investments in food security, but it's not enough. We need to also include the other sectors, particularly the private sector. That's where the new alliance was launched, and that's where we really dove into building private investment for food security and agriculture. And then I saw, you kind of see the arc come to digging into what we actually need to do in food security. So 2013, we had Nutrition for Growth, which was so fantastic and really focused on this such important issue of building investment in nutrition specifically. And now Germany, 2015, is still... Is, Food security and nutrition is still high on their agenda. And that has not always been the case. At the beginning of this process this year, food security and nutrition was a point on a much larger agenda. And over the months, and I can confidently say, with the support of and the pushing of the US government, food security and nutrition has become a major component of their G7 agenda. And we fully support that. We support their focus on food security and nutrition, and we also support the fact that they're really turning their attention to impact. So previous G8s, G7s have looked at investment and input, and now we really need to turn our attention to impact. And I think that we see that outside of G7. We see that in other venues that address hunger and nutrition, but we're really supportive of that, of that transition. Well, that's what I was thinking about, and, and Rick, thanks for asking that, that question. That, so even in, even in the, 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 the G7, G8 body, they're, they're looking at, at <coughs> food security, <coughs> nutrition, as this kind of ongoing, that, that each of these initiatives build on the one before, not just separate things that, okay, the Americans are doing this, so we got to have our, our point on this, you know, then, then, then uh, uh, in the UK and then now with the Germans that, okay, well, we need to say something on this. There is this recognition of this continuum that, that, these, that these, all these things actually continue to build uh, on each other. Absolutely. And the Germans then are figuring, yeah, particularly, well, what's, what's, what's happened? What's right. the impact of all right. this? And, and how do we uh, build some steam behind that? Yep, Schengen. Well, the Germans will develop some concrete goals. If I remember correctly, they wanted to push like 500, um, 500 million undernourished people or malnourished people be out of uh, uh, hunger, malnutrition from now to 2030. So there is a clear time frame, by the way. <laughs> and they also ask the G7 country to double, at least to double their financial commitment. If I look at the roadmap, the U.S. is currently investing about three something billion dollars. The ambition is to increase to five. So that's nearly not, not yet double your commitment yet. So is there any sort of a concrete evidence that without doubling the investment, the G7 goal will be, will be achieved? Do we have any political support behind the document? In terms of the five billion, I think that um there's a number of challenges. In addition to looking at the dollars and the funding streams we now have, I think, sorry, um, the international community needs to also think about how we 
back to the emergency category and what we're now seeing across the world to think about how we globally respond to these crises because the funding streams that we now have to deal with these circumstances is insufficient. And so I think we need to think about it in a different way and think about it more from a standpoint of national security and threats to security throughout the world and take it out of the humanitarian space in some respects because the response is insufficient. The response to what's happening in Syria and the overflow of refugees into Lebanon and Jordan and other places. So I think there's a number of challenges um, and as we look at what needs to be done, that's an issue that we as an international community have to focus more and more attention on, looking at new paradigm, new ways to think about the challenges. Can I jump on that? Yep. Um, so I think that's really important. And I think that, you know, funding is hugely important. We can't have these targets, we can't have these goals if we don't have the resources to really make them happen. Um, but I think that we also, as a, in, this isn't new. This isn't new to anyone in this room. But I, it's really important that we look to all sources and all streams and all opportunities to fund these investments. Um, official development assistance is a huge piece of that, and you all should not stop going to the hill, and you should not stop pushing for that, whatever number you're pushing for. Um, and I think that you know, Rick, as you said, there's a lot of bipartisan support, and I don't think that that's going to go away. But that can't be it. We can't just be looking at public investment in for new. We have to talk about capacity building in country. We need to be building capacity of our civil society colleagues in country so that they can have the same level of advocacy to their government, so that their governments are putting their own domestic resources in, into nutrition. We also need to make sure that we have a functional and positive relationship with the private sector that has an immense set of resources that we can put to this problem and build those partnerships and that um, and really activate those streams, which I don't think that we're doing yet. So it needs to be more than just ODA, and obviously we need to really build in those innovative financing pieces, which a lot of this conversation is going to be happening this July in the Financing for Development Conference. Yep. Well, and the, the question at, at, every, at each of these summits is, is there new money coming in, or where, where is the money coming from? Is it just being shifted around? Is there new... In, in the deliberations of the, of at, leading up to the G7, a recognition, so as Rick says, that it's, it's, it's beyond the humanitarian realm, so to, to move it out of there, but a recognition of the leaders of, of, of all the great industrial countries that ending hunger and malnutrition is actually a vital economic matter for all of these countries, for all our, the countries involved in it, and for the world as a whole. So it's not just an issue, yeah, we're doing this for people over there somewhere. And talk about, okay, well, what's civil society and things, and, and, and the government's capacity building in those countries, and that's important. But getting to the bottom of this, of this issue, which is then is the core of reducing uh, poverty, is just a vital economic interest uh, for, for the world and for the, for, for the economic stability of those countries as well. I know the Germans are on top of that with everything going on in Europe. So. Can, can I say... Yeah, but I mean, so Liz, you, it was, is that... The, the one thing I would say to that, and I think that what we need to do, what we haven't done, because I agree with you, that's what we need to do. We, I think over the last year or two, we've really started to hone in on the economic case for nutrition, but we're still talking to ourselves. We're still telling ourselves about that economic case for nutrition. We need to make sure that we're talking to the finance ministers and the prime ministers and the other agencies and the other ministries that really have a role in this and not just talking to ourselves. You know, Rick, mm -hmm. I, I just want to say that uh, you've been to Guatemala. It's interesting mm -hmm. that in Guatemala, the entity that played the lead role in ramping up their whole nutrition effort was an entity that was focused on competitiveness. Mm -hmm. And they basically said, we will not be a competitive country if a large sector of our population is not properly nourished in those first thousand days. They looked specifically, and the Lancet did a study on the mm -hmm. impact on GDP in Guatemala of malnutrition in those first thousand days. Children who were stunted, who would never be as productive intellectually or physically than they would have been otherwise. I agree with Liz, we need to do a better and better job of empowering and providing technical assistance to a lot of these countries. I think if we're going to look at one area where we can significantly expand, and it's not a big dollar item, it's technical assistance capacity building to countries to help them implement some of these nutrition goals. Yep, Schengen. Yeah, could I also, and then we'll, we'll yeah, start with... Building on that, let's also look at uh, do not neglect the middle income countries. 
Mm-hmm. A global yes. food policy report 2014-2015 very much focused on middle income countries. Firstly, these countries still account for more than half of the hungry mm-hmm. people in the world. Mm-hmm. Secondly, the way to eradicate the remaining poverty hunger is not aid from G7. Mm-hmm. It's their own policy, their own strategy, their own practices. And so what is the role of G7 here? So how can G7 also leverage these middle income countries to eradi- eradicate hunger for themselves, but in the meantime help Africans, maybe uh, South Asians, in achieving hung, um, zero hunger and malnutrition. So the middle income countries could be part of the game, could be part of the uh, effort. Right. Well, when you were talking about yeah, the, the less progress being made, say, in Africa and South Asia, I mean, that, that, so India is obviously a, uh, a big player there and that they yeah, orient themselves uh, to this program. The new government there, I mean, do you see impulses coming out of there that, are, are, that you're encouraged by? Well, I think, uh, yes, some positive development where the government tried to introduce more liberal policy to reform economy, so we would expect higher economic growth because the, uh, the reduction in malnutrition is highly correlated with economic growth. But that does not end over there. In particular in India, there is a dislink between economic growth and the improvement in, uh, in nutrition, mm-hmm. so the dislink. Yes, economic growth will provide great opportunity, but let's make sure that nutrition and health, come, health outcome will be part of the, uh, the development agenda. So not just a magic number of growth, 7%, 8%, or even 10% growth. So again, the opportunities right. are there. Right. It's not just money. No. It's a policy. Uh, it's a strategy. It's investment priorities. It's accountability. How can we make these local governments, even the local community, accountable for nutrition and health outcome, where the Maharashtra is a good case. Mm-hmm. So when the local government, local community are accountable for nutrition outcome, they will look for solutions. You don't need to tell them. They are looking for solutions from you. Hey, do you have any advice, strategies, investment priorities that we can use to reduce hunger and malnutrition? The, uh, yeah, good points, and particularly that, as Rick said, with Guatemala and in, in India and, and all these other countries that are recognizing this, and I think through the World Food Program and then others that have been kind of coordinating each country doing an economic impact of the cost of malnutrition and hunger, I think those countries themselves are finding uh, uh, a lot of, of uh, surprise in terms of what impact it does play on their growth and their numbers and, and their other uh, ambitions. Before we go to everybody else's questions, which we'll do so, get your thoughts ready. Uh, Rick, on the roadmap, so the three that have been done so far, including this one, have all been under this administration and, and the Obama administration, as Liz was talking about, and some of the, the, the number of the, the programs that have come from them, some directly following you know, the, the, the points uh, of the roadmap. Um, so what comes beyond uh, this administration? How does one keep this uh, going and maybe in the State Department, you have kind of a, a, an, an overview of things that okay beyond the just the, the who's in the who's in the White House or in Congress. How do we continue on this? And Rick, if this is addressed in the in the roadmap or uh, anything that will also then be addressed to during the whole transitional uh, process of whoever the next administration would be, that this is so vital and we need to keep this up. Well, uh, let me just highlight one of the recommendations uh, from the most recent roadmap, and that is legislation. I mean, that is one very important tool to ensure that this comprehensive approach is institutionalized. So the legislation which would identify the elements of a comprehensive approach call for a whole of government engagement, request that a plan be developed with clear indicators that could measure success. Legislation will help ensure that this is institutionalized, that this commitment carries on to the next administration, but also the group of organizations and individuals involved in this area has grown exponentially over the last number of Mm. years, and we are all collectively committed and will not relent, whomever the next president (laughs) is. 
Please. Can I just add on that one thing? And I think the legislation is a great way to kind of institutionalize the work that this administration has done. But the other thing that I think we as a global community need to do to be get ready for the next administration is make sure that our messages are right. Because we all know this space in and out. We know how important it is. We know the moral case. We know the economic case. We know the numbers. But I've been in this job for years, and it has taken years to really understand that. We don't have years to get the next administration up to speed on this. So we need to make sure that our messages are so strongly on point, poignant, simple, but complex and true. And I think that that's really difficult, is just getting the messages right. right. And Rick, optimistic that there will be legislation that is not just kind of a one-year continuation of, of, of this, but, but embeds it as this is, this is what America should do. Yeah, uh, the, and there's... Legislation has been introduced in the Senate. There's legislation that's moving through the House. I'm confident that what ultimately um, evolves from Congress is a effort that will institutionalize this long term. Um, the funding streams have been authorized a long time. Where mm -hmm. We have the capacity to spend the money, but what's needed is a structure that talks about the coordination and the pieces that must be part of legislation. And I think to Liz's point, that's I think one of the strengths of the whole roadmap effort and the number of organizations involved is to make it clear that it's not just one thing. You can't just focus on agriculture development as the key to ending hunger. You need to think comprehensively. And that's why I thought the roadmap was so successful in clearly identifying four pillars that one can integrate and leverage benefits by understanding all of the pieces together. 